of my talk today is Życie na Pożomie, which translated into English means the classy life, underage prostitution in recent Polish cinema. Uh, and this is a paper, a version of which I did present at Brown in April. Um, and this is something that's in the work, so I hope you enjoy it. Like many teens around the world, Agnieszka likes to spend her free time in the mall. But during the afternoons she spends in Warsaw's Arcadia, she is not merely looking for shoes. Instead, she's shopping for a sponsor, someone with whom she can exchange sexual favors for material goods. Defensively, Agnieszka tells her reporter that, I know they call us prostitutes, but I'm not a whore. It's simply a lifestyle. It would be cool to have a fling with a guy, but what would I get from it? There is money, though, and there are clothes and some kind of power among the people you know right away. And what's the sponsor? It's clear. He wouldn't give me money if I weren't pretty, right? Of the identity shifts and new communities that have accompanied the democratic transition in Poland, one of the most shocking is the recent phenomenon of underage prostitution. Agnieszka is just one voice in this larger community that has recently fallen under the lens of Polish directors. Today, I will be presenting on this community, specifically about its depiction in recent Polish cinema, focusing on the factors that have created and sustained this subculture. But before I would begin, I would like to contextualize this phenomenon through Jacek Kuzempa's 2005 study, A Frontier Childhood, Piggies, or About Underage Prostitution. In this work, Kujempa interviewed underage female prostitutes about the main motivators of their lifestyle. 46% claimed that they had become underage prostitutes for economic reasons. Other reasons included rowdiness, 9%, desire, 7%, necessity, 15%, and under the influence of female friends, 17%. Note that Kujempa draws a clear distinction between, quote, economic reasons and necessity. It is not need that fuels the majority of underage prostitutes, rather the desire to consume. Specifically, the schwinki, literally pigs, <coughs> a slang term for underage prostitutes, strive to achieve status among <coughs> his or her peers. Status in Poland is a direct correlation to consumption and is achieved through fashion, electronics, and en vogue nightclubs. Status has become an obsession among the post-Soviet youth in Poland, and a commodity to be purchased by those who can afford the lifestyle. Without money, Schwinki use their only currency, their bodies, to achieve this status. Consumerism, Kujempa postulates, has also played an important role in the popularization of premarital sex, traditionally taboo in Roman Catholic societies like Poland. Increased contacts with advertisements and TV shows has created, quote, a green light for sexual freedom for viewers, especially for youth. In this way, consumerism has a twofold effect on the rise of Schwinki. Status motivates their lifestyle, while advertisements legitimize it. Three recent films, Kasia Rozwaniec's Galerianki, The Mall Girls, Robert Glinski's Schwinki, Piggies, and Jarosław Sztandara's Luxus, Luxury, artistically take on this phenomenon. And since I'm assuming none of you have seen these films, I'm going to do just a brief introduction to each of them. The Mall Girls, Galerianki, a film that was made in 2009, follows Alicia, a 13-year-old girl who has recently moved with her family from the countryside to Warsaw. As she struggles to be accepted into her new school, she falls in with the Galerianki, who exchange their bodies, like Agnieszka, for clothing, makeup, alcohol, and electronics. After Alicia rejects her classmate Michał, who represents a morally superior alternative to the Galerianki lifestyle, she must face the tragic consequences of her decision. Um, and if you look here at the picture, uh, I didn't want to include um, trailers so I could actually have time to talk. Um, you see here, Alicia is on the right. She's wearing a jacket and jeans and is regularly dressed. And then the three girls uh, that I guess are to your right, they are the Galerianki. These are the mall, the mall girls. And you can see the way they're dressed. Um, they're wearing expensive clothing. They're wearing, at the time, what was very fashionable among the youth in Poland. Um, so you can see here the depiction of the difference. And they're in a mall when this is taken. Okay, the second film, Piggies, tells the story of Tomek, a 15-year-old who lives on the Polish-German border. In order to impress his new girlfriend, Marta, he becomes involved in illegal smuggling activities and finally succumbs to the pressure uh, to prostitute himself to middle-aged German men across the border. 
After Marta leaves him for an older, richer Polish man, Tomek becomes a pimp. Soon thereafter, his closest friend Chimne, the Dark One, who introduced him to the world of prostitution, dies after sustaining fatal injuries at the hand of a sponsor. Tomek is soon arrested by the German police. And here we see Tomek on your left, and then that's his girlfriend Marta who leaves him. And finally, lu uh, lux uh, Luxus, or Luxury, is about 17-year-old Luxus, uh, who has become too old for his pimp. Rather than casting Luxus out on the street, he takes him to Warsaw Central to recruit quote-unquote fresh meat, including Młody, uh, literally young boy, a homeless but moral youth living at the train station. After vain attempts to prostitute himself in Młody, Luxus re reluctantly returns to his pimp, bringing him Młody as a reconciliation gift. Młody, though, is able to bind the pimp, and he and Luxus run away to an unsure future. Uh, and in this picture, I, sorry about the quality, uh, you see Luxus uh, on the left, he's very uh, concerned, and then you can see Mwode, who's trying to give him sausage. But he won't take it because he's too wrapped up in what's going on. Okay, so following the, uh, 1989, the influx of consumerism has been accompanied by the rapid creation of an infrastructure of, quote, non-places. According to Marc Auger, it is in the non-place that supermodernity naturally finds its full expression. The anthropologist creates a dichotomy between the place in the film's home and the non-place. And these are the mall. This is a traditional, typical mall in Poland. I think they look the same everywhere around the world. Uh, the border. This is a Polish-German border at Frankfurt am Oder. And the Warsaw Central train station, um, which is a transitory space. So Ojek postulates, if a place can be defined as relational, historical, or concerned with identity, then a space which cannot be defined as relational or historical or concerned with identity will be a non-place. By taking up residency in these non-places, underage prostitutes have become passengers in a perpetual present. In this space, the passenger has a simultaneous experience of a perpetual present and an encounter with the self encounter, identification, and image. He is a well-dressed 40-year-old, apparently tasting ineffable delights under the attentive gaze of a blonde hostess. In this way, the protagonist's identity becomes merged with these non-places. They see themselves donning designer clothing, taking expensive trips, drinking the finest cocktails, and living the classy life, all at the tender age of 13. The relationship between place and non-place is constantly in flux, much like the identity of the inhabitants of these competing spaces. All three films suggest that Schwinke are moving away from place, again the home, and taking up residency in these non-places. Specifically, the name Galerianka linguistically reflects this change in citizenship. The Anka ending in Polish is applied only to female residents of cities, so you have names like Krakowianka, Warszawianka, and so on. Therefore, by their very name, the Galerianki are citizens of the mall, removed from the greater context of society. In luxury, neither Luxus nor Mwode are given first or last names. They are known only through the characteristics with which they have been labeled. So Luxus, of course, means luxury, and Mwode, because he's 10, is called the young boy. Similarly, in Piggies, characters lack family names and are referred to in the credits by their relationship to Tomek, suggesting the absence of any real familial ties. The non-place, then, is used in an escape from dysfunctional daily life, where traditional providers of moral norms, family and school, are portrayed as either ignorant or completely helpless in the face of the demons of Western-style consumerism. Subsequently, there is also a shift from traditional moral values toward the centrifugal forces of mass commercialization. Milena, the leader of the mall girls, has created her, mo her own moral standard. She believes that, quote, love in our times doesn't exist. You just have to party, get really drunk, and not get used to it all, right? Director Rozwaniec criticizes Polish parents who are absent in their children's lives and have created an emotional void, thus leaving the younger generation to construct their own moral compass. Rather than learning from their parents about love and sex, they read about it in Cosmopolitan, then act out this knowledge at clubs, drunkenly at parties, thinking that they're doing it right. There is an implicit confusion between love and sex, and this is repeated throughout the films. 
Both Agnieszka and Milena de-emphasize the emotional and glorify the physical, but as Rosuaniet suggests, this is merely a product of being lonely and unloved at home. The families portrayed in the film reflect Rosuaniet's observations. Alicia's family is fragmented. Every member of the family is living in their own world. Even her father does not realize that her mother is having an affair while he is away at work. After Alicia discovers her mother's infidelity, she can use it as leverage to, consider her, to continue her own lifestyle. It is only when Michal, Alicia's love interest, kills himself that her mother shows any kind of emotion while begging Alicia not to cry. Her father is also emotionally absent and unable to see the state of his own family, and this is implied that it's due to work because he's constantly leaving the home and you only ever really see him when he's moving or watching TV. Um, and this is really uh, drawn out in one particular scene in which Alicia's mother gives her father some cake that she's bought. Um, and she tells him that she made it herself. And of course you can tell the difference between bought cake and homemade cake. Um, and so it almost implies that these girls are much like these cake, that he can't really tell the difference of whether it's bought or not, just as long as they're there. It's almost as if the presence of family makes up for sort of the emotional bond of family, and he, he really can't tell the difference. Um, and so he's unable to observe the tragedy that is really unfolding beneath his own nose among the women in his family. In Piggy's, Tomek's life reflects Alicia's. His parents, like hers, are absent or too overworked to be fully cognizant. His father is striving to become a soccer trainer, subsequently doesn't work, therefore is financially unavailable. In order to make up for her husband's dream, Tomek's mother is forced to work extravagant hours to provide for her family, making her emotionally unavailable. Lacking support from his family, Tomek turns to school and the church for emotional and financial support. At his German school, he is an active student and is fundamental in building the plans to create a state-of-the-art observatory for which he's trying to get EU funding. When his teacher is unable to procure the funding for the telescope, Tomek becomes uh, disheartened. Desperately, he turns, like many Poles, to the church. Rather than truly listening to Tomek, the priest is dismissive and appears only interested in garnering youth members. Uh, and in this scene in particular, he says, well, if you bring Chimne, your friend, then maybe we can talk about it. Because Chimne never shows up, of course, the priest loses interest and just kind of forgets that this promise of funding ever occurred. And really, it is only on the club and the border where Tomek uh, meets Marta, he feels a sense of solidarity and community. And when everyone else seems to have forsaken him, he chooses this lifestyle and subsequently the Schwinki lifestyle. Molde, unlike Tomek and Alicia, does not have a family. He's homeless and makes a living by convincing travelers at Warsaw Central that his dog is ill and asking for money for medication. Despite his roots, of all the film's protagonists, he is easily the most morally, uh, traditionally moral. Another striking example of the dissolution of traditional Polish values. Why is it that these characters that have families are essentially immoral, whereas this young boy who has no family really is the moral, probably the moral standard, the traditional moral standard from all of the films. Um, he, in his own way, it works respectfully to survive. Um, I'm not sure what a phenomenon this is in other places, but in Poland, if you're homeless, uh, if you sell things and you have the tendency to make a living, it's respected a little bit more than stealing, for example, um, especially for if you're young. Uh, and this, these are just my observations, having spent time uh, in places where this occurs regularly. Um, in asking for money, he neither harms himself nor others. Uh, so his life, which is lived in and around the train station, is essentially supported by charity. Although, like Luxus, he could be tempted to become a Schwinka and live the classy life, he refuses. Luxus arranges a photo shoot for both boys, but Mwolde is appalled and refuses to participate. Luxus, in vain, continues to try to attempt Mwolde, who could make Luxus potentially a lot of money, by showing him his expensive jewelries and pictures from his trip to Egypt, but Mwolde is clearly unimpressed. Rather than compromise his own morality, Mwode believes that they should use the pimp's contacts and really quite intelligently bribe the customers for their silence. 
Upon discovering this plan, Luxus's pimp becomes outraged, sending Luxus into a personal crisis. Should he hand over this fresh meat and continue his former lifestyle, this desire for status? Or should he stay with Mobe and struggle to morally survive? Although, through Mobe, he begins to understand the immorality of his lifestyle, uh, he looks to his pimp as a father figure and does not want to disappoint him. The pimp or sponsor acting as a father figure is another common theme in the films. Where their own fathers have become societally impotent, they radiate towards men who are able to provide for them, both financially and emotionally. Once again, we see this implied confusion between what is love and what is sex. But in a community where the home has been replaced by the supermodern non-place, and parents by sponsors, perhaps this is really the only logical progression. At the end of luxury, mode ex luxus, no soteras. So what are we going to do now? Reflecting the uncertainty of, the, of this post-Soviet community, despite attempts of organizations like Kid Protect PL, a Katowice-based initiative to curb the impacts of the Schwinki lifestyle, the phenomenon seems to be on the rise. Now, for those who are of age, of course, a website like shukamsponsora.pl, I'm looking for a sponsor.com, uh, make this lifestyle much easier. So it seems that Agnieszka will continue to be able to fund her own classy life for years to come. And for as the old cliche dictates, where there is a will, there's a way, even in the supermodern age. Thank you.